So Kelly, why do you think these big fish will go after your streamer in this kind of water right here? I think it's mostly just a predaceous thing. You know, they're a, big browns are the, they're the top of the food chain in the river system, you know, and so they, they're feeding, it's a, you know, it's a predation thing. They're just out munching whatever comes in their territory. Kind of, you know, we were talking about grizzly bears earlier. Same thing, they're, they're, the, they're the grizzly bears of the river. I don't think a lot of times they're even eating it for food. I think when we get those swats, you know, when they come up and just kind of uh -huh. hit it, I think a lot of times that's kind of like uh, just a warning. Just kind of like get out of my neighborhood. You're in my neighborhood. You don't belong here. Yep, and so they come up and give it a smash, and that's all you're going to get out of it. And, but the beauty of fishing a streamer is, I mean, the size of the fish, even if you don't hook up, it's a fish you'll never have seen on a dry fly. You know? Exactly. Big honking fish. <laughs> Just had a near fatal loop in the back of the reel. I'll get it. Darren, go ahead. Good call, Darren. Black Willie. Coming at me. Coming at you, Darren. Could have picked a better place to hook that thing, you know. <laughs> yep. There we go. Ho oh, ho! Six pound fish, it looks like. <laughs> Here, shoot that one again. <laughs> All right. It's a big black woolly. So, oh. <laughs> stoned on me here. Stone wall. Stone wally. Fantastic. Ooh. Stuck on that woolly bugger on me when I wasn't looking. Black woolly scoping. Conehead. Oh, yeah. That's easy six pounds. All right, well, you pulled that out. It was just around the corners where we end. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> now, we don't have a lot of water left, so that was good work, Kelly. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, you made the call, right. buddy. You're the one that said put on the black. For many of us, this is a once in a lifetime trout, a fish that is really over five pounds and caught in a river. The point of this video is that this does not have to be the case. You will be able to catch big trout routinely if you apply the tactics and techniques Kelly Gallup has developed over years of guiding and study. He will tell you how, where, and what to use to catch such fish, and the rest will be up to you. Kelly's first goal, however, will be to help you understand what is different about big trout. You need to change your thinking before you change your techniques. The reason we like to fish streamers is be basically because we like to catch big fish. And big fish eat big flies. The theories that I've developed with a lot of my friends uh, who like to streamer fish as well are all based on the fact that fish aren't necessarily eating because they're hungry, they're eating because they're predators. Predators have a job. Their job is to clean up the weak, the dying, the injured, the very young, and the very old. It's a real basic premise and it happens throughout all the animal kingdom and trout are no different than anything else. They eat big because once they become predators, they eat at certain times of the day and night. And they're not so much concerned with eating like a, a mayfly done or something like that. There seems to be a point where fish stop eating insects and they start eating meat. A predator's job is to clean up whatever system it lives in. A lion's job in the Serengeti is to clean up that. A big brown trout's job is to clean up this river. Basically, they eat the, the very young, the very old, and the injured. My theories are based on the fact that the fish is very seldom hungry. The fish is a very efficient predator. They eat very large items, 
as big as half their body length as often as they can. And what I mean by that is, is that the fish has a time when he feeds and when he's just resting. And we've found that through different types of radio telemetry studies and just basically fishing and uh, doing a lot of scuba diving, the fish are not always in the same spot twice. You have to understand, we're fishing for a different breed of cat here. We're looking for a big fish. We're not concerned with that 16 to 20 inch fish. We're looking for the 20 to 30 class. And when they're rare, obviously, but you have to understand that they have different habits than most of the other little fish. They have feeding times when they're out actively searching for food. And they'll actually leave their holding areas. Those times are in the early morning light, you know, for like two hours before sunup, two hours after sunup, which is going to give you that 4 a.m. thing to maybe 8 a.m. And then again at night, two hours before dark, two hours after dark. And what they're going to do is they're going to leave their holding areas and they're going to go searching shallower uh, gravelly substrates where the bottom is made up of smaller pea gravel to cobblestone and what that tells you is that the fish is going to where the little fish live. They're basically going out looking for small fish in their feeding areas where the small fish live all the time. Once they've got there and they've eaten then they'll go back to their holding areas. And that's why I say that we're not generally fishing because most of us don't fish at that time of the day. If we're lucky, we get out and we're out there at seven o'clock and that's generally when the fish is going back to where he wants to rest. You know, if time you get you know, into the water and get fishing, maybe it's eight o'clock. So that time of day from then until right before dark, the fish is in a holding pattern. He's just resting. These are big fish. So you've got to be there. You know, most of us have jobs and have to do things that make us fish when we can, not necessarily when the fish is most active. So what I'm looking for is something that triggers that fish. The fish isn't always exactly where he was when he was feeding, so we go, when we have to fish all day, we fish to where the fish should be. And how we do that is to go in and fish the areas that we think are gonna hold the most fish uh, in a resting mode. That's why I say that they're not always hungry. Once they've gone and they've fed, they go back to another spot to just sit there and rest. So what you've got to do is look for areas like that. And, and believe it or not, they're not necessarily the things that we've been taught all our lives. When we look at the, when you look at the river and you say, well, there's a distinct feeding lane. A feeding lane is for a juvenile fish or a fish under 22, 20 inches that are eating insects. These fish very seldom eat insects. They're looking for a big bite. They're looking for meat. And that, all predators are the same. They're going to go and they're going to look for the biggest amount of food in a short period of time, then they're going to go back and they're going to rest. All predators are the same. They've got feeding areas, they've got resting areas. We have to establish where those areas are. One easy way to see that is that the fish is looking for a substrate that's softer than the, the gravel areas where they eat, where they go to hunt and eat. Substrates tell you that there's not enough. If you've got a substrate that's soft, for example, marl or silt or something like that, and it's about three foot deep, that's great holding water. On the Madison where I'm standing right now, there is no marl because it's too fast. So I have to establish different areas that might hold the biggest fish. That doesn't mean there won't be little fish in it as well. I've done a lot of scuba diving or free diving and found fish, really big fish, 25, 6, 8, 30 inch fish, holding right beside what would be six hours later, maybe their dinner. They'll, they'll hang out together. So it doesn't mean just because you've got a feeding lane you don't have any big fish in it, which leads you to the fact that you try to hit every inch of this river. After you've fished a river, maybe you know six, seven times, and you consistently bring the biggest fish up to your fly in certain types of water, you kind of figure it out. But you can't, there's no, there's no specific point you can say that rock's going to have a fish on it until you've fished it quite a bit. And even then, the fish, you know, they think on their own. They'll be in places you don't think they will be. So consequently, you've got to hit, try to hit every two foot of the water. And as we wade down the river, I'll show you what I mean by that and how I try to, you know, what I look for. As far as the rivers go, you know, being that there's all different types of rivers, you're going to have to establish certain times of the day, which fish are, you know, where, what time of the day use what color flies and we'll go over that a little bit as well but 
for the most part, you've got to cover all the water as thoroughly as possible and let the river tell you where the fish are going to be. What we have are fish that are in holding zones. They're in holding areas, just like a big cat on the Serengeti, you know, that's hunting gazelles or something. If you've ever watched TV and seen them, they have specific areas they go back and they rest. You see them and, you know, whenever you see one of those videos, you'll see a big cat laying there with his full belly and you'll see gazelles walking by this, you know, cat that's going to sleep because he's going to have feeding times, he's going to have resting times. What we have to do as the angler, trying to tap into that dark side of that predator's brain, we have to elicit the strike. We've got to make the fish wake up and just make him jump out of his resting area because he's not really programmed to eat at that time of the day. We have to run in there and just kind of kick over his dining room table and say, wake up, you know, I'm going to get away. What we do is we go in there with a big fly, and I, I like to use flies that have that look like food, but I also want the fly to be big enough to trigger something in the fish's brain that says, you've invaded my space. You've come into my living room. You, now you're running away. You've got to pay the price. And that's what we do. We're going to aggressively come in with a fly. We're not coming in trying to look like a minnow that, ooh, there's a good little piece of food. We're coming in, wham, we're going to slap down the water, and we've got to get the fish's attention. It's, you know, I've often said to people, you can't turn off an instinct. You clap my hands behind you, you've got to jump. You can't turn instinct off. You can turn food hunger instinct off. When you're full, you're full. If you just had a great big steak dinner and somebody walks up and says, you want a hamburger? No, not really. Seven, eight hours later, yeah, you want the hamburger. Right now, I'm full. I'm sitting in my holding area. I'm resting. Something else has to trigger me to say, I'm going to attack that. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to trigger that instinct in the fish's brain that says, you've invaded my territory. Because they also have a fight or flight mechanism in their brain. All predators do. You slap the fly down, he has to respond. He's like, ooh, what was that? And now you start to run away. You're going to tr look like you're injured. You're going to run, and that's the other instinct. Whenever I'm doing a seminar, it's the same scenario. If you're in bear country, which I'm standing in right now, they tell you to do two things if you're in bear country. If you startle a bear, which is the first thing you can do, don't run. And the reason you don't run is because that triggers the bear's dark side of his brain to get you. All right? They tell you to just freeze. So what you're going to do is you're trying to play this whole scenario reverse. You've gone in there, you've startled the fish, and then you're going to try to escape. That tells the fish attack because he's not hungry. You're just getting him to do something that he has very little control of. And then you want to have different things that trigger the fish as well. I want the fly to be big enough to startle him, but I still want it to look like food a little bit because he's used to seeing that stuff. And then I want it to run. And then, boom, I get the illicit, the strike right out of the fish. He may not even want to do that. He may not even eat it. He may not want to eat it. You're going to get a lot of false charges, and that's what they are. We call him getting the Heisman when the fish goes by or giving you a drive-by. He runs by. He's just come up and said, you know, you're in my zone. Get out of it. He may not even eat the fly. He'll come up, boom, just charge you. He's going to get it if he really wants it. That also leads a little bit to the types of flies that we use. We use really big flies. But in the last, say, three, four years, we've switched over to a different style of hook. I've started to use a lot of short shank hooks. These fish are programmed to eat the head of the fish that they're attacking. All predators and prey have a relationship that's uh, balanced. They all have a little bit of an advantage and a little bit of a disadvantage. One of the advantages that the little minnow has, or even a little trout, is it has fins that stick up, a spiny dorsal. The spiny dorsal has a, it has a purpose. It, ha it keeps the fish from eating it from the tail, coming up behind and biting its tail and then swallowing it. If it did that, it would die. The spiny dorsal would stick up, it gets stuck in the fish's throat, and he'd die. So they pro they're programmed to eat the head of the fish. They're always going to strike the front of the fly. So when you see, if, when you see little fish, and they, little fish will come up and they'll nip the tails. Big fish don't do that. They inhale the fish, they come at it head first, and consequently we've started to use shorter shank hooks. When I first started realizing this, it was, uh, I don't know, about five years ago, I was fishing Clouser minnows, one of the best flies ever developed. 
it's on a short shank hook. I started looking at other things. I had fish where I would set the hook and wham, 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 and I'd get it off, you know, boom, it'd be off, and I, I, I couldn't figure out what was happening. Finally, one day I saw one come up, eat an enormous fly. It was about a seven and a half inch fly, but it was on a Kerry Stevens long shank hook. And it actually, this was a very big fish. It was an eight, nine pound fish. Had the fly in its mouth, and it was sticking out of its mouth. I mean, there was five inches of fly sticking out of this fish's mouth. And I could see the head was, and I'm ripping on the rod, and I can't get the fly to go into the fish because the hook's all sticking out. Eventually just lets go of the fly. That finally clicked the light on and said, well, we've got to start using different hooks because we were using hooks that were four inches long. So we've developed a lot of patterns that are on uh, short shanks, articulated fly, the TNA and the TNA bunker were part of that design. But basically, we're looking at the saltwater hooks. You look at a fish, you know, like a tarpon or a bonefish or a permit, all those hooks are really short shank hooks. Even your giant fish, your marlin, your, you know, all those things, the sailfish, they're using short shank hooks. Partly they've realized a long time ago that these fish, even a tarpon that's got a mouth this big around, inhales that fly, gets it in its mouth, he's going to do it head first. The other part of that equation is that a short shanked hook is really hard to torque. It's hard to twist that fly. And we lose a lot of fish, we, and we don't so much anymore, but we used to lose a lot of fish when the fish would start to roll, when we're fighting the fish. And we'd actually, you could see that the hooks would actually be bent. And so that told us that they were torquing that fly. I never lost fish on uh, clouser minnows. And that was kind of the telltale, right, for me, is that I had to switch over to the smaller hooks. So now we do a lot of, we still use some of the, you know, the standard 3X long uh, type flies. But for the most part, anything bigger than a, say, oh, two and a half inch long hook, we start changing the style of fly and we start using uh, articulated style flies and things with shorter front hooks so that we get we get that head strike we've got something to uh, set the hook with. The flies that we're going to use the smallest fly that I fish on a regular basis is probably like this one which is about two and a half to three inches long. Uh, we fish a lot of flies that have a broad imitation. Some of them are very specific like the the zoo cougar is very specific to a sculpin. But the woolly sculpin, for example, might be a crayfish, might be a minnow, might be a sculpin. It has certain telltales that say it's got a broad head, which maybe makes it look like a sculpin. But it's also got, maybe it's in white, and you know, the fish isn't white, or yellow, or chartreuse, and the sculpin isn't that color. So we've got multiple trigger points. We're looking for something that goes in, like we said earlier, it goes in, bang, it startles the fish, wakes him up, if you will, he's sitting in his holding area, wakes the fish up, has a lot of motion because when we take off running, we want the fly to take off and run and look like he's, you know, getting away, but then he's got to be light and fluttery like he maybe he's got an injury of some sort. And then he's got to look a little bit like food. He's got something that says, you know, to the fish, wow, that, you know, that's edible. So it's, you know, one of three or four different trigger points that plays into this because we're looking for as many trigger points as possible for the fish. Everything that comes in our, in our favor to trigger the fish just says, you know, that's, that's a fleeing, that's an escaping, you know, minnow or whatever that triggers the fish. He looks like a sculpt and he's coming up. He says, okay, I got a lot of things going for him. Boom, he comes up and he eats it. So when we get to the flies, we're going to base as many things as we can, but maybe not exactly. The one thing I found with a lot of flies that are really, really exact is they have very short windows of opportunity. If the fish is hungry and you're, you know, fishing minnow imitations, and you fish, you know, a perfect example are the mylar minnows that they used to tie a lot of. I've never caught a fish on one, period. And they look exactly like a minnow underwater. But everything was based on just the fact that it was food. We don't fish for little fish, and we don't fish for fish that are eating minnows that long. So basically, I'm looking for a fly that's big enough for a fish 25 inches to waste his time to come up and eat. I don't think those big fish waste time on little tiny fish. So I'm going to use flies that are three inches and up. Uh, the bigger the better, but I also am going to fish for fish that are not looking for small food. Kelly covers a lot of ground in a hurry here, so we'll review. 
First, we need to accept that big trout are the top predators in the river. They prefer a large meal as opposed to a bunch of small ones, and you need to abandon more subtle presentations if you are going to catch trophy trout. These trout are out looking for a big meal and are going to eat minnows, smaller trout, crayfish, leeches, or very large bugs. This means you will need big flies for big fish. Kelly won't fish with anything under two and a half to three inches, and he likes a shorter shank hook because the prey is taken by the head, and longer shanks can leave the hook itself outside the fish's mouth. Big trout feed very early and very late in the day. Target these times if you're going to fish traditional trout lies where you usually catch your smaller fish. After their peak feeding hours of two hours before and after sunrise and sunset, you won't find big trout in these places since they have moved to holding water. Holding zones for big trout are not where you might imagine. Most commonly, they are two to six feet deep and just off the main current flow. Big deep pools and log jams are not ideal holding zones. Big fish are often found over a soft bottom during daylight hours, indicating a lack of heavy flow. And it's the depth that provides them cover rather than the structure. Undercut banks are an exception to this rule, but usually it is an inside turn where the water is not as fast. Just behind boulders is another great place to find big fish resting. Our presentation to big fish in holding water shouldn't be subtle. We are trying to wake them up from their nap and trigger a territorial or feeding response. We want them to teach our fly a lesson for invading their home or chase it down as an easy meal. Our fly should come into the big fish's bedroom abruptly, not on a slow, easy swing. And we want it to exhibit as much action, injury, and fear as we can impart to the fly. Where Kelly fishes on a river is critical. The water he concentrates on are those holding zones where he knows big fish like to hang out. He will take apart this run on the Madison to give you an idea of where to fish in a river. As I look at this scenario right here, there's multiple areas that I'd want to key on. I'm going to start way downstream there. You can see in the middle of the river, you see that rocks kicking up a little white water. To the left of that is a slick. It's closest to shore. That would be as a wade angler where you'd probably walk through it without paying attention. That's the one that you got to make sure you pay attention to. The fish is going to hang inside on the left of that slick where it's real calm in there. But the fish is never going to not have an out. He's going to make sure if something scares him, he's going to be able to get into that fast water to relax, you know, to make sure he's covered up. So when you're looking at these situations here, you know, everything in my psyche that I've been taught as a fisherman would tell me to fish the right side. But what we found is that these big predators would actually be in the softest water. So make sure you fish that inside if you can. In this situation, you could wade right down the middle, fish both sides of the river. Uh, so start there, make sure you fish the inside. Of course, go back, fish the outside as well. Then as you wade up through this seam, you can see where the the river kicks in there a little bit to the left. It looks like it cuts through the back side of that uh, bend. There's a big soft spot as well right there. And what you're looking for is just soft water. You're looking for stuff that the fish can hold in. But that's ideal. As you look at that little inlet where it goes in there and you see the branches sticking up there, they're you know, kind of bright and sticking up. There's structure, there's, there's soft water. And then right in the middle of the stretch there, you can see there's a little faster water absolutely perfect. You got holding water and you got an escape route. The fish is always going to have an escape route. So when you look on that, you've got that soft water. As you come up, you see this on the far left here in the middle of the river, there's a, a boulder and that's breaking water. And if you look behind that boulder, you've got another perfect scenario. It's very soft water behind that white water. That's a negative hydraulic. That water's going upstream at the very bottom of the river there. It's going to top, over top of the rock and making a circle and it's actually a very soft break. That's another ideal spot for the fish to hold. No current to break. If he needs to get away from something, zoom. He just slides over a foot or two, 
nothing can see him. He's very secure. As we move upstream, this is another great situation just moving up this bank as you can see. You know, another great holding area for the for the bigger fish is close to the banks there. Anytime there's an undercut bank is ideal for the fish because he can slide either direction. And it's generally, if you look over there, you can see that spruce bough hanging down in the water, very close to the water. And there's a real soft break right there. It's only three foot to the shore to the fast water, but it's a very soft break. Just upstream from that pine bough, there's a boulder. It's broke the current. It's nice and slick for that whole bank is ideal holding water because it's about two foot deep, which is plenty, and it can move either direction. When you've got undercut banks, nothing's better. An under, where they can just slide back underneath there, they're, they're away from all the predators that could possibly you know, come around them. Like mostly what they're concerned with are shadows, and, and it's from their youth. There's not much that can hurt a predatory sized fish in, this, in a river. A fish gets over 24 inches or so, not much is going to pick it up, but it's still, you know, when an osprey or an eagle goes over or any big shadow, they'll, they want to be able to get out of that, you know, plain view. So they're going to slide under the banks, and that's, that's great. And they also use color changes. If you look at the tip of that island where it's shallow, you can see the brighter gravel. And if you go out just to the, you know, 10 feet to the left of that line, you'll see a very distinct color break. That's another ideal situation. They'll hang right on that color break, and it's amazing how well they'll be blend into that background. As you come in towards the bank of the main channel here, this whole inside bend, every bit of it, is a fish holding area. There doesn't look like an enormous break in the water. There really is. It's, a, it's probably flowing half the speed of that main channel. And what these fish are going to be looking for is that break in water where they can just, you know, lay real relaxed right there. And if they want to, they just slip back out. This is also kind of a multiple situation, what we've got. We've got the shallow gravel over there, and then we've got the holding water, which is ideal because the fish can move as much as, they, you know, average is 1,000 meters in certain areas that, when they've done the radio telemetry studies. But that's going to and from for the food. In this situation, that's a entirely, that entire spot is a feeding area. So the fish might only have to move 100 feet to feed. So this is perfect. So this fish can hang right here on this soft inside, move over there just to the tail out to where the little fish are, feed at night and move back. He might move upstream 1,000 meters. He might move downstream 100 yards. You don't know, but it's ideal right here. You know, as you look up here, there's just a, a multitude of things that, you know, broken water here and there. But really what you've got, it's a pretty easy breakdown. You just look for the soft spots to the right there. You can see some on the left. What you're looking for is a break in the water, a place where the fish can comfortably hang. And every river is different. You know, it's not a game if there aren't two players. They've got to all have a deciding factor, and then you've got to figure it out. This broken water like this, has got just everywhere you look, there's another possibility for the fish to set up and hang up. If it's soft water, you've got to look for ledges and different things underneath the water that tell you where the fish can just comfortably hang. So as you look at this, look for areas that you think the fish could just basically hang there without fighting a lot of current and then leave himself an out. If he's got a spot to get away and hide from you, that's where you're going to find the biggest fish. You're not worried about the feeding lane. You're simply worrying about a resting area for the fish to be in. This is, you know, a complex grid right here, but when you break it down into little 100-foot squares, it's really simple to see where the fish is going to stop. Look for that soft water. Look for the pockets behind the big obstructions where the water's broken up and not a fast current, and just get your fly in there and go sideways to the current. I'm going to drop down in here, and I'm going to fish this all the water we just talked about and just fish that entire edge all the way through right there. Now that we have a good idea of where to look for big trout, it's time to look at the rig that Kelly uses. There are other ways to streamer fish, such as using a floating line, long leaders, and weighted flies, but Kelly believes the system he has developed is the most effective. 
He also is convinced is the least tiring and by far the most exciting. The system I'm going to be fishing and the system I use for all the fishing I do for streamers is pretty much the same. I use a really basic leader, three foot long, uh, 20, 18 inches of 20 pound, 18 inches of 12 pound. Seldom go less than 12, uh, frequently fish straight 20. I'm using a sinking line. The closer that fly is to the leader, or to the line I mean, uh, the line sinking and trying to draw the fly down. And that brings up a good point. I don't use weighted flies ever, uh, with the rare exception of a cone head, but I don't build weight into the fly. What I'm looking for here is a fly that is really light for a couple of reasons. One, a light fly is easy to cast. I want a fly that jettisons its water very quickly. When I do a back cast, I want it to kick its water out so I can get back in accurately and quickly, and a heavy weighted fly doesn't do that well. It becomes a real laborious task to throw a weighted fly. But more importantly, what I've found is that a heavily weighted fly does this. It's going through the water, and if I stop pulling it, it's straight down, it sinks. And I've often used the analogy that a possum makes a living out of dying. A predatory instinct is to chase and kill. When something dies, for example, a possum, when it sees something and it just curls up and is dead, it doesn't get eaten. The same thing can happen with your fly. If you're stripping your fly and you're running and you stop stripping the fly and it sinks straight down and it looks like it's died, you've lost that predatory instinct that tells, you know, that makes the fish come up and try to kill that fly. I want my fly to take off running as I strip the fly and then it's, I want it light. And if you look at a lot of the flies we've, we've used, the flies are light and they flutter. Every time I stop pulling that fly, when I stop stripping it and it hits a current, I want it to do this. Personally, I think that looks like injury. I think when it goes like this and it hits a current and it kind of flutters a little bit, it triggers more instinct to the fish to say, that thing's got a problem. It's injured, boom, I'm going to be on it. So consequently, I use the short leader and the light flies. And the reason I, the light flies, because if this, flying is, this line is sinking and the fly is coming with it, if it's too long, this fly would be way up above the line. So I'm using a short leader to keep it as close to the line sinking as I can. That's how I regulate how deep I fish is with the type of line I use and the length of leader. The fish are not looking at this leader. The heavier, the better. You want to catch these fish, once you've hooked them, you want to be able to put maximum pressure on the fish, bring the fish to you as quickly as possible. Two reasons. One, the less time you've got on, the less chance you've got of losing it. And two, the less time you've got that fish on, the much better chance you've got of reviving that fish and letting him go healthy. I'm going to use a, I'm using a full sinking line. In the last two, three years, the line designers have put a lot of emphasis on fly lines. The uh, Scientific Anglers, for example, has built a sink tip streamer line. It's the first one since mine came out with Jim Teeny that somebody's built a specifically streamer related line. In the next two or three years, there's going to be more and more and more because people are really starting to uh, target these big fish. So the equipment's changing very quickly. Rod wise, I like a nine foot six weight. That's just, you know, everyone's different. My co author Bob likes an eight and a half foot rod. Everybody's got a little different idea. I like a really fast rod through the butt section with just a little bit softer tip, uh, like a medium flex tip. This is the uh, St. Croix Legend. I love this rod, it's nice and light. Light rods are important because you're gonna fish a lot. You're gonna cast a lot when you do this. In a day's float, for example, if I'm float fishing, I'm gonna try to hit every two to three foot of the bank that I'm fishing and if I'm wade fishing, I'm going to get even more casts in because I'm standing here. You can't have a brute of a rod because it just wears you out. As far as reels go, uh, this happens to be a Lamson. I like large arbor reels. I don't really care so much if you, know, if you like a different style of rod or reel, excuse me, that's fine. But I want the large arbor reels and it's, it's for a reason. One, these lines take up very little space there you know this you can see this i've got my lines are only 60 feet long the ones i designed and so they don't fill up the spool a lot i want the large arbor reel to hold because it doesn't coil the line down really tight 
I've got lots of backing on here, but the big thing is, is I've got a really big arbor, which picks up about 10 inches of line per revolution, but more importantly, it doesn't coil my line in a tight little spool. If it was down on a small spool, I'm, it would be very kinked. These lines have a, uh, some of them have tungsten coatings on them to make them sink. Uh, they, they've all got different uh, elements to make them sink, but the base thing is, is that they, they tighten up on the spool and they'll coil on you. If it's really warm, you don't have that problem. But a lot of us fish, you know, in really inclement weather, especially in the fall for these big browns, and the, if it's really cold out and you've got a small arbor reel, you got a lot of kink to your line. These large arbor reels pick up line quick and store it well so you don't get as much coil. That's about as complicated as that has to be. How to cast and retrieve your fly are the next important things to understand about Kelly's system. To do this, we head to the Osabo River in Michigan. Though Kelly is now on the Madison River in Montana, Michigan holds his home waters and is where he grew up and spent 25 years guiding. He joins Bob Linsenman on a float of the Osabo River. Bob is Kelly's co-author on the book they wrote titled Modern Streamers for a Trophy Trout. In the book, and Kelly and Bob I unveiled mean, their streamer fishing techniques fishing that they spent years developing. The jerk strip retrieve is a key part of the specialized tactics they use to catch big trout. What I'm doing with this retrieve is I'm keeping the rod low. I'm letting the line belly slightly. I'm stripping with the rod, or I'm, I'm jerking the rod. It's called, this retrieve is called a jerk strip. And the idea here is to manipulate or animate the fly with the rod, not the, not your stripping hand. Most stripping, most fly animation is done like this. This is as much as you get, all right? And it's a poor, it, it works, it, it gives some animation, but you can't give nearly the animation of the fly that you can if you use your rod tip. So what I do is, Keep, let the line belly a little bit so there's some tension on it. Keep the rod low. You snap the rod or jerk the rod, and then your strip just brings the rod tip back, pointing at the fly. So it's a sequence of strip and, strip and jerk, jerk and strip. And you, what you can do is you can do longer pauses that way. You can do short start and stop. But the critical thing is, is when you strip the line back, if you get your hit right there, if it happens while you're stripping the line, while you're jerking the rod, I mean, you've got great, if you're, if you're in the middle of a, a jerk on the rod and the fish hits, you've already set the hook. And what you're doing is you're constantly keeping the rod tip going back at the fly, so you're controlling it. You've got a static line or it's connected to the other it's a tight line. So you're always in hooking position. And then you can, you can change up your rhythm. You can change your number of you know, snaps you give to the rod. And you can do several different types of retrieves that way. And you're always in hooking position. You're always pointing the rod at the fly or out towards the fish. So when you do get a fish, you can just set up and you're right there. The, one of the most common things you'll see people do, that, and when somebody's good at this, they don't appear to be moving nearly as fast or as doing as much as someone who's just starting doing it. When you see people that are uh, starting to do this, they tend to overanimate their bodies and they end up doing this. They get way over here. It's not necessarily somebody just fresh doing it. It's just, it happens to everybody. You get excited and you just kind of, for some reason, run away from the fly. But if you start stripping and you, you'll know if you're not in the right sequence, if you start doing this and you end up over here. Now, if the fish hits right there, you're gonna do this and you're done. You have no way to control that fly. You're always trying to optimize your motion here. You're trying to reduce as much as you can and keeping everything happening in front of you. That's why when you first hit the water with the fly, 
Uh, I'll do it on this side so we can see it a little easier. When you first hit the fly on the water, what you want to do is let it just for a second, let the line settle in just for a second. Oh, little fish hit it. Ooh, hit it again. And what that, when you settle the line down, when you're doing it, you're letting the surface current take the fly line. And then you can work in front of yourself and you'll still get the fly to move because you've got tension on the fly line. The surface has now it's just made a slight belly in the line and I can make the fly react with, it looks like I'm not doing a lot right there, but I'm moving the fly how I like to move it in six to eight inch movements with a very small amount of rod. If I want to go farther, I just, I just double up my distance, you know, and I can go 12, 20 inches if I want to. I just, but I like it to move in six to eight inch strips. I'm minimizing my effort here. I'm not putting out a lot of uh, effort. In the book, we talk about keeping center just like a fighter does in the ring. A good fighter, you don't see, they aren't flailing around. They're, they're minimizing their movement. They're keeping everything tight. And it's the same thing with this. Your whole, all the effort you're trying to achieve here is, should be done with very little movement, you know, with your body. This stuff, doing this, getting way over here, the biggest, you know, the, the biggest problem is it's not that you can't make the fly move. It's just like we use the same analogy in the book. If you were in a prize fighter, if you're in fighting in the ring and you turn your back on your opponent, you're probably going to do poorly in the match. Kelly, I found that, from my experience guiding, that most of the people that have a problem adjusting to or accepting the jerk strip retrieve are those that have most of their fly fishing experience either in salt water or in, in lakes and ponds. Mm -hmm. And there the, the strip, just the straight strip, will work really quite well. well However, any place where there's current right, that's also your ally, the jerk strip will just flat out outfish a strip mm -hmm. retrieve in my opinion, five or six to one. And I've had saltwater guides just freak out when I've used it, but the reason I've used it in salt water is because there's been a tidal current and a mm -hmm. tidal rip, and it works much better. Yep, if you, and it, it's exactly it is, it's the current. When you're in a lake and you're just sitting here, you're doing this, because what else, you know, you're stripping right back at you. And yep. when you're in the salt flats, you know, it's the same thing. And there, especially in the salt, you know, their biggest concern is getting a decent hook set. The optimum position of your hands is to never leave this box right here. Your hands can't go up to your eyes. You don't want to, you never want to lose sight of what, you, what your opponent's doing, what your fish is, your, the, the fish you're fighting. And you always try to keep that fish in the square your hands always are here in front of you. No matter what the fish does, your hands don't leave right here. And then you position your shoulders. And we, again, we use that same analogy as, as a fighter. You square your shoulders to your opponent. So you always stay here. And you do that because you always want eye contact. So if the fish comes here, your whole body turns with the fish. If he goes up here, your whole body does this. If you want to make up line, you know, one way or the other, if you want to, if the fish is going somewhere, you want to direct your line to him so it's going under an obstruction or something, you have mobility to do this. And if you're pointing the rod at the fish and you lift up, you make up eight feet. If he comes at you faster than that, especially in a river, but it ha works just as well in a lake, the key to remember here is that the fish is running from the line. He is not running from your rod tip. The tension the fish feels is off the line. So if the fish runs at me at his 30 miles an hour, and I pick my rod up like this, he's running at me and he's dragging the line. If I go like that, I pick the line off the water. He has very little tension left. Now, if the fish, if I set the hook, I keep my rod low, so bang, I set the fish, the hook. Ooh, got one. Ah, see that? Uh, 50 casts in there, and that fish just came up and ate. <laughs> if I keep the, uh, 
rod low. If I set the hook right now and my rod's low and the fish runs at me, current's pulling the line that way. If I put my rod tip just like this and do nothing, don't have to do a thing, I have the current tension coming on the line. Yep. The fish is running from that. I could put my rod tip just like this and that fish couldn't possibly, he's not going to shake the hook because he's dragging the line. The line's being dragged down there. I could have a totally slack rod just pointing just like this and still have sufficient tension on the fish so he couldn't shake the hook. If I do this, I pick my line up off the water. If he jumps, there's no tension. I've lost the fish and I've lost total position. So you watch someone who's good at fighting a fish. They don't appear to be uh, going one way or the other. They just, they, their hands stay right here. They move their hand, they move their rods low, but you never see them get their hands up. And, of course, you're gonna get excited sometimes and oh, try to make up line. I encourage people when they're trying to make up line, put your rod right in the water and strip right here. You've got all that tension of the current and the same thing in a lake, it doesn't matter. The fish is running direct. If that fish comes straight at me, he has to make a loop just like your cast and drag the line. So it doesn't matter where you're right if it's low because he's dragging the line. How you on? handle your line during the retrieve can be as important as how you make your retrieve. Kelly can't seem to emphasize enough how important it is to always manage your line from behind your trigger finger. And I saw an article once, I don't even remember what it was in, but it was someone was talking about picking up a lot of line. And the, the thrust of it was is you reach up here high and you pull like this. And that is, and I'll tell you right now, number one problem in line handling is ever, ever reaching in front of this finger. I agree. When I guide, I tell people it's a sobriety test. You can always touch your fingers together, but if I tell you to close your eyes and touch this guide, you aren't going to do it. And in a panic with a big fish, hands start going out of position and you see people start trying to reach up and grab their line. So let's say you're successful and you draw this line down. Now, the next thing that happens is you want a visual, and so you start looking up, trying to get the line, because you can't let go of it. Oh, if you let get go it of it, underneath your you've got to get it under your finger. So all of that, this is where the hands start doing this, and everybody does the same thing. They start looking up, and they're totally out of connection with the fish right. that they've got on. Yep. Your eyes never leave the fish. No matter what, you always watch him, and you strip from behind your hand right here, and you do this, you can make up a lot of line. As soon as you reach up here and try to transfer, you'll get in trouble. You should never, no matter how you manipulate, I don't care if you're in a lake, if you're fishing still water and you're just barely moving a midge and you're gonna do it with your little finger it's like this, little figure eight, still behind your finger. Yeah. When the fish hits, you gotta have tension. If you're stripping salt water, you do the same thing. Absolutely. The one exception I can think of ever is when you'll see guys, and I don't know how many, I don't do a lot of this, but you'll see salt water guys doing this. Barracuda fishermen. Yeah. And, you know, but the key to that is when they do it, they throw out and they're trying to do an extremely fast retrieves. When they do it, when they set the hook, they set the hook, they've got the line in their hand. Yes. All right, and they transfer from here and they're ripping line. They just simply transfer and you go to the same process. But you always end up with the line under your finger. Just once. Snorkel fish, oh, there he is. That's a big fish. Okay. That's a good one. All right. That's a good one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's gonna be better than the last one. That's a good one. Finally happened, Bob. Yep. Well, with your skill and my brains and beauty, <laughs> it had to happen. Where do you want to go, big boy? Oh, we're fine anywhere right here. But I can when you tell, tell me. You. He's got a funny look to him. Pardon? I'm not sure that's a smallmouth. He's got a funny look to him, Bob. Is it a smallmouth? I'm thinking so. It is. It sure is. 
Well, it's a tug. It's a good tug, too. I thought I'd finally broke my skunk on that corner. I'll just lip them, Bob. Okay. That's a mandatory thing with these smallmouth, ain't it? Come oh, that's that. a beauty, smallmouth. Yo, Gorgeous. Jimmy, is this? What would Jimmy say? Pretty little he, fish. He's a pretty little fish. Funny looking little fella. It's a funny little fella. Where are his spots? <laughs> Where do his spots go? Ellie is going to fish a number of different places on this stretch of river to show us how he works the water. He starts in close, first on a small pocket that is holding water, a place we might walk right by if we didn't know better. Well, this is a perfect example of a holding water uh, for a daytime holding water. As you can see right here, I've got a break in the water where it's coming around this corner. And what I've got is I've got a back eddy right here. This is one of the bigger back eddies on the Madison. And this is an ideal holding area back here. It's, but it's extremely limiting for the wade angler to fish. So I come in here and we're, we've just discussed the fact that the fish, the big predatory fish, has come back in the daytime to hold in this softer water. But as a wade angler, I'm limited to, I'm gonna walk through the fish before I get to it. And I can't tell you how many times I see that in any kind of river. For example, this river here, if it was uh, not as riffly as it is, if it wasn't as bouldery, that inside corner up there would be where I may walk into to fish out. That will be right where the big fish is hanging. So I've got to address that before I come into the corner if I possibly can. Sometimes you can't. Fish wins. It's going to happen. But as often as you can, you have to make sure you make some cast into this slack water here before you wade through it because if the big predator's sitting in this two and a half foot of soft water and you wade through it, probably aren't going to get a shot at them. What I'm looking at right here is from that point of that rock where it's nice and soft, I'm going to want to fish all of this right here, all the way down as far as I can want to go, but I'm going to want to fish from this point right here in. This water out here is not soft. It might hold fish. It's really tempting to just go ahead and plop one out there but somehow you have to address this inside trail. You'll find that if you walk the river, I mean almost any river I've ever fished, you can see where most of the anglers fish. And it's generally right where the predatory fish is going to go and stay, uh, rest. That's why we see so very few of these fish taken. So before I fish this seam, because like again, I said I want to fish from here, I'm thinking the fish will be hanging from here to here. But I'm going to want to cast down here, you know, what, as a trout angler, as you come up from a dry fly perspective, everything you know about fishing tells you to fish right along this seam where the fast and the slow meet. To do that, the streamer, I have to cross that like this because I'm waiting. If I was boat fishing right now, I'd be, I'd have perfect example. I'd be, I'd be in the middle, I'd be casting to here and I would effectively cover all this. As a weight angler, I can't do that effectively. So I'm going to make sure I throw a cast into this water that I'm going to have to walk because it's too deep for me to stand out there. If I can, I'm going to get in the middle and I'm going to fish to this shore. I, I can't do that. It's too deep there. Uh, even for the camera, I can't do that. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to make casts and I'm actually going to weave this in two directions before I walk through it. I'm going to throw to the right side here and I'm going to draw a fly through from the right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that, mostly because I'm not going to get a perfect uh, angle, but I'm not going to neglect to do it either. And I'm also going to throw in this and I'm going to cross this way. So I'm going to kind of weave a pattern where my fly comes down this way and this way to fish this so I don't walk through it before I get a fly through it. Again, there's limiting factors to both weight angling and float angling. Um, 
you know, you, we don't all have the luxury of going out and having somebody row us down the river every day, and we fish on foot a lot. So you've got to address that problem. You've got to make sure that you look at all the, all the water and give it a, an appropriate cast and retrieve to cover that water before you walk through it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to weave this. I want the fly to cover this water I'm going to walk down before I trod through it. I can't tell you how many times I've been waiting uh, before I figured out where these fish were that I would wade and I would see a shadow just slide out from me. These fish don't run. They're not running hightailing from you. They figured out how to be safe here. They just simply slide out a little ways and they, they're aware of the danger and they just don't, you know, you can't get them to respond. If you come in on this inside and just make a few casts, you know, don't make them sloppy. Not, you know, don't do it without intent. Make sure that you cover the water before you get to it. Just you know, a handful of casts before, before you make the walk, and you're good. At least you've got to the, reassure yourself that you haven't spooked the potential fish before you even get a chance to fish to them. Make a few casts through there and work the fly. I try to hit every two foot of water that I can. And as you see what I'm doing, I'm trying to throw the fly I like the fly to come sideways to the fish. I don't want the fly's tail to swing to the fish. So I'm going to work this seam sideways as much as I can. Again, I'm looking at the seam being right here, and before I walk through it, I'm going to just put a handful of casts down through here because it's not a, it's not a perfect angle for me. There's limiting factors, and this is one of them. It's not a perfect angle, but I'm going to throw a cast through there and I've caught lots of big fish in this in just doing this before I get down there. If the fish is on the break and he has the depth and the current flow to protect him, you know, the depth is a big thing. You'll see these big predators and they'll be hanging in the uh, wide open. They don't necessarily need all the structure and all the stuff that we think that they need to hide. They're the biggest fish in the system. They don't nearly as concerned with hiding from everything as the smaller fish are. All right, I've effectively covered most of that 20 feet without falling in. I've effectively covered most of that 20, 30 feet there. I've cussed, the fly has been seen. I'm confident that I'm not gonna, if there was a fish there, he's either not gonna take or I'm not gonna spook him. So now I'm gonna run this seam right here. Uh, if it's, you know, you've gotta decide what type of retreat or what type of uh, presentation you're going to give to these fish and where you think the best likely holding area is, I think it's going to be right here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to step this up. I'm going to aggressively fish this. I don't waste a lot of time on a run. I give a run, you know, two casts maximum to a spot. You, you, you're not going to entice the fish with a hundred cast to the same area. So you're looking for players here. You're not looking for every fish that's sitting there. You're looking for the one aggressive fish that's really, you're able to trigger that instinct and you're, you know, elicit the strike out of the fish. So you don't, don't plant your feet and say, I'm going to fish from here to that tree. Plant your feet here for 10 seconds and say, I'm going to fish from here to the other end of the river. Fish as much water as you possibly can. So come in here, I'm going to throw this in, I'm going to throw, keeping my rod tip very low. I often have my rod in the water, actually, it'll be slapping the surface of the water. I'm using short casts, I'm just covering 30 feet max, right here. Keeping my rod real low, I'm using a jerk strip retrieve, and I'm going to cover every two feet every two feet. Boom, boom, boom. I'm using a short darting cast. All right. And I'm going to cover this. I want the fly's head to be going downstream if possible. If not, I want the flow here. I want the fly to be going across stream. I never want the fly to swing tail first to the fish, ever. I'm keeping 
my line, my stripping finger that's on my rod. I've got good control over that. Critical that the second that line, I mean the second that fly hits the water, or the line hits the water, that this finger gets crossed. The line hits, boom, your line, your stripping fingers got a hold of that line. The second it happens. You never, in any fly fishing situation, I don't care if it's a dry fly trico or a tarpon, the second the line hits the water, you cross your line under this finger or this finger, whichever happens to be the one you like, and you never reach in front of that hand again, ever. You never, ever reach in front of this hand and do this. The reason is, is the second you reach up there, you lose control of the line. Even if it's to strip it back here, if you got a fish right there, now you've got a fish on, your hands are going to separate. And you're going to fight to get back to that. You're going to be doing <clears throat> like this. Okay, well I fished this, this little seam here. I haven't got a fish. Uh, I fished 25 yards and I think I probably covered that in less than five minutes. That should tell you something. I went through it very quickly. I probably have 100 casts, maybe 150, fishing both sides of the river right here in this soft water. And now I'm just going to continue down. I'm going to fish this seam as far as I can. It's getting kind of deep here, but it's going to shallow up. I'm going to always try, if I have the opportunity as a weight angler, I'm always going to try to be out there fishing to the bank. And it's going to narrow up here. It's going to allow me to fish down, get out in the middle, and fish back to the inside. Whenever I can do that, that's what I'm trying to do, from the middle to the shore, because the fish is resting in this softer water. In certain situations, on certain rivers, you're going to find fish in the middle resting. The Madison, for example, has got a hump in the middle, and there's a lot of boulders in it. Anything that breaks that water current, anything that stops the flow of really fast water, for example, a big boulder will often have a pretty shallow spot behind it where stuff builds up, and the current starts flowing like this, and they get a real negative break, which means the water is going upstream sometimes. That's a great holding area. It may not be classic, you know, soft water to look at the whole picture, but if you look right behind the rock, it's very soft. So as you go down, you identify which is the holding water as best you can. And here, I'm softening up on the right, so I'm going to try to angle out, and I'm going to address that inside bank. As often as I can, I'm going to fish from the middle to the shore. It seems quite simple when you watch Kelly, but there are a lot of things he is keeping in mind as he is fishing. These are the principles of this jerk strip method of streamer fishing and it won't hurt to go over them again. First, he fishes downstream, and when possible, from the middle of the river in towards the holding water. You run the risk of spooking fish, but it's worth it. You are set up better to present a streamer because you want to be directly across from where you're casting. Kelly grids off his water and covers every two feet with his fly. You're never quite sure where the fish are, so you have to make sure they have a chance to see your presentation. He moves quickly, his approach is not to fish the same water over and over. This is not a subtle technique. If there's a big fish in the area, chances are he'll see your fly. Kelly would rather cover a mile of river quickly than beat a single likely spot to death. Depending upon the nature of the run, he might make short casts first and then extend them out. He seldom is fishing a line longer than 40 feet. Keeping a short line keeps you in touch with your fly. And you're more likely to make a hookup when you do get a strike. Your presentation should always be with a nice crisp cast and slightly upstream. Your fly doesn't have to fall gently on the water, but it can hit abruptly and wake up the resting trout we are targeting. When Kelly first casts, he likes to give the fly a small twitch immediately. Then he pauses momentarily to let a slight downstream belly develop in the line. This is not a dead drift presentation. What we want is for the current to grab the line and pull it. If need be, you can add a short downstream mend to achieve this. We want the fly to be headed downstream and then across current. The trout will get the best view of your presentation in this way, and it appears as if it is trying to get away. You want to move the fly with your rod tip 
and not by stripping the line. You take up the slack line with your strip, but it's the short twitch of the tip that imparts the action to the fly. You jerk your rod tip with a short upstream wrist movement. The fly should be moving erratically in six to eight inch bursts. We are trying to make it look frightened and or injured. Again, we are trying to trigger that deep and dark predator instinct in the big trout's brain. It is essential to keep the rod tip low. A low rod tip keeps the line on the water and puts you in touch with your fly. As a result, your retrieve is more erratic and you're always in a position to make a better hook set. As important as a low rod tip is that you strip from behind your trigger finger. This ensures that you'll never lose control of your tree and puts you in great shape when you've hooked and are fighting a big fish. Okay, as I approach this run right here, what I've got, I've got a little island above me that's breaking the current. I've got a pretty, you know, hard current in the middle here. This is all real shallow gravel, and right in the middle here, right here, down, I've got a, a ledge. I've got where it goes from deep to shallow. Now, I can't get out in the middle and fish from the middle in, so I'm going to fish it on this soft side. I'm going to cross that current. I want to cross the current with the fly coming as close to straight across the current as I can. So I'm going to cast slightly upstream, allowing for the, the line to get caught by the current. And then I'm going to keep the fly coming downstream with its head downstream slightly. And I'm just going to walk this ledge. Ledges are really huge fish holders because they've, the, they've got the shallow break on the what would be the left side here and then they can escape into that deep water or the fast broken water where nothing can see them from above. And I'm just gonna make, you know, a cast so I come through every two foot or so, you know, two, three foot, whatever. If you think you've covered it in uh, two foot, great. If you think it takes four, do as many casts as you think it takes to, so that the fish has seen the fly everywhere through that run. I don't have to cast way out into the middle of that. I don't think a big fish would hang in that really fast water. The only thing that would get him out there is if he's spooked, and then uh, it's a pretty low percentage to get him to come up and eat if he's been spooked. So I'm just working this run. Before I, before I walk through down to the next run there, which is going to be a totally separate scenario. That one's a soft pocket, a soft water pocket behind a boulder. So I'm just going to run this fly sideways every two foot. You see, I take a cast, the same angle upstream. I'm stripping the fly, coming across that ledge. I do a cast. I take a step downstream. Same cast, same retrieve. Doing a jerk strip retrieve right here. And I take a step. I always look when I, if you notice, when I, I finish a cast, I'm down here. I take my step, I always take a look at where my fly comes out of the water. Just as a, I just see what it went by. So when I do my next cast, all right, I come through right there. I've already taken a look. I saw a dark rock right there. I saw the fly was two foot below that rock. I knew I covered it quite well. So I always take a, you know, take a look at it. And I know where the flies, that way I know I've grid this thing off. I've taken it in two foot. Ooh, just had a little roll, little fish. Uh, I just take it off in steps, two foot increments every time, and I know I've gone through it. Now I'm coming to the tail end of this, this ripple here. It's starting to pick up momentum, and it's getting to the front side of this boulder down here, so I'm gonna still fish through it, but I'm not gonna fish through it like I did up here. I thought the fish would be in this run, and so now I'm going to move down. I'm going to slide in behind that soft pocket of water on that boulder. And then I'm going to fish that opposite bank looking for, you know, just looking the scenario over. I'm not getting fish in this fast water. I'm not getting them on the ledge. So I'm going to try the soft side of the water on the other side of the river where I can fish from the middle of the river to the bank and bring the fly back out, which would be the same scenario if you were fishing in a boat, which is ideal for the weight angler. If you can get in the middle, and this is ideal for me, and this is great 
great pocket streamer water right here because I can stand on this island and fish both shores. I can't effectively fish that far shore where I'm casting to because the, the main current is so intense that it just takes my line. I can throw some into it, but I can't effectively hit the other bank. And that's just, that's just the way it is. You can't fish every inch of the water. Uh, even from a boat, you can't. You just, there's always a limiting factor. You just have to play as many options as you can. Traditionally, what would be done here is you would throw down and across with a mend and you would swing your fly, all right, on a tight line swing like this, and you would swing the fly tail first through all these fish. And you would, you would quarter it off the same way, down and across, and you'd still, you know, grid this off. You would still dissect it into two or three foot increments, but you'd just passively swing the fly. And I, it, you know, you'll catch fish that way, and you'll even occasionally catch a big fish that way. But percentage-wise, I catch far less really big fish with a swing like that than I do with the aggressive cross stream. The fish has got to come up and eat it from the head, so you're asking the fish to come up, turn on the fly, and eat it like that, and it's just really rare to have a big fish do that. I'm not saying it never happens, but it's percentage-wise, it's far less than if you would take the fly, cross stream, and start an aggressive cast down. You'll notice that I'm not letting that fly sink very far. The reason is, is well, it's twofold. One, I want to fish, I want to elicit the strike out of the fish. If the fly goes too deep, I might get down into the deeper water. Maybe I'll get another fish to come up off bottom. But most of the fish aren't hanging. What we've found is the fish are hanging in less than four foot of water. And the biggest thing for me personally is that I want to see it all happen. I want to know what I've done has brought that fish up through the water, that my manipulation of this fly, my selection of the fly, all of that combined, I see the fish come up and attack the fly. 99% of the time, for me personally, I'm going to be fishing what's called the jerk strip retrieve, where I'm going to actively be fishing the water with a fly that's coming downstream slightly, with its head slightly downstream, manipulating the fly, getting it to swing, I mean to, to pulse. I want it to jump, start, stop, start, stop, just like that. I see every inch of that happen. I see the fly. I see the fish coming up. Everything is visual for me. I get to see everything that happens. And I cover a lot of water very quickly. Across stream, fly's head is downstream. I'm seldom fishing more than 18 inches deep when I fish this style. Again, I want it to come up. I want to see it happen. I want to see the fish commit to the fly. To me, that's just part of the whole experience. So I'm seldom fishing more than you know, mo most cases, I'd say I'm fishing less than 10 inches of water, trying to get the fish to come up through that column of water to feed. That's why it doesn't really matter how heavy this line is. I've heard people say that they, they don't like to fish sinky lines because they can't mend them. Well, you don't need to mend the line. You actually, mending is to create slack or to stop drag on the line, on the fly. I actually encourage that. I'm going to throw this fly out. I'm going to let it sink just a second, and I'm going to start this retrieve. What that does, it puts a natural belly in the fly line, which automatically makes the fly's head go downstream. And that's what I'm looking for. I want it to be going down and across. So I welcome any drag that that line is, well, any of that current creates any drag on the line because it's belly in the line a little bit and keeping the fly going in the direction that I want it to. The other thing that the drag on the line does, uh, the surface current creating that bow, all right, it's out. As soon as it starts to belly like that, anything I do with my rod tip, with my line, makes the fly move because it's tension. There's tension on the line the whole time.
Here we've got another situation where we've got a, an obstruction in the middle of the river and it's creating a great break in the water. A boulder or other obstruction in the river offers its own special challenge to ensure that you cover the water properly. An obstruction in the middle of the river, you've got a hydraulic going around both sides of it and you've got a big soft eddy right dead in the middle of that, right there. So it's nice holding water uh, for, a, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 feet below it, there's a good soft pocket of water. It's pretty nice, you know, you could have a big fish in it. It wouldn't be my first choice, but it wouldn't, I would never pass one of these up. So what I would do to fish this is I've got three basic holding areas. I've got this one right here on the inside closest to me. It's got depth, it's got color change, and it's got current break. I've got the one right in the middle where the water's going the slowest, and of course I've got the identical thing on the other side of it. So to fish that well, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to cover both sides of it. I'm going to cast beyond both sides, you know, the opposite side to me. The problem is with that is that the middle eddy is the slowest. So what happens is your fly comes and it makes a big serpentine right there. So before I go all the way through that water, I generally take and do a handful of casts right on the inside like this closest to me, just, just in case there's one hanging there. Then I go across. You've got to work fast with this scenario because the fly is going to get sucked into that slow water and you've got to realize it's going to get sucked in close so you want to have a good tight line so you cover all of that water. If you've got a slack line or a big cast, it'll make a big curl go upstream and then back down and you'll end up missing this inside bend or a break, I mean. So that's why I do the few in the first part here. I do a few in close to make sure that I hit that both sides of this. All right, now I've hit that inside. Now I can cross both currents, come across like this, looking for the big flash right there. Still going to do it the same way I did upstream. I'm still going to hit every two foot. I'm going to come across stream, showing every two foot in case there's a fish on either side, and just breaking the water up into little pieces. Good. I, you know, you fish it pretty fast. I mean, I'm almost through that run right now. It's 30 feet long or so, it should take, if you're going two foot at a time, that should take 15 casts to get through it. And I've pretty much got it worked through. Now, I know there's fish in this run. I've nymphed this run 100 times. I know there's juvenile fish in here or fish under 20 inches but I didn't get a rise out of any big fish. You know, again, I'm fishing for a trophy. I'm looking for one player. It would be very enticing right now, very easy to say to yourself, wow, well, I know I could go in there with a nymph and catch, you know, a handful of little fish, or not little fish, but, you know, nice fish, but I'm not looking for that. I stick to my guns and I'm trophy hunting. I'm looking for one player one big rod bender. Now I've worked through that, I covered both sides of it effectively. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over, I'm going to go back to the top of this island. I like to fish downstream. It's hard to fish upstream, it's hard to go like this and fish upstream and come back down at you, the current. I fish down, just letting the line work for me. I'm letting the current pull the fly down and get a good manipulation. So I like to fish up, down, not from the bottom up. You can do it either way. If you wanted to start downstream and fish like this and fish up and take a step up, you can. But I don't, personally, I'd rather start up and fish downstream. So I'm gonna walk up to the top of this island right here and then I'm gonna show you how I'd fish that outside bank right there. I'd fish, this is ideal for me. I can fish from the middle of the river to the bank, bringing the fly out, and I'll cross every inch of this water from here, from this break in the boulder, 
down to the tip of that island right there. I've got a perfect trough right here to cover both the edges and the middle of the water. Standing in mid-river and casting to the bank is one of the most productive ways to cover water. It sets you up ideally to make a great streamer presentation. The slower water at the bank holds up your fly. Your line bellies in the swifter current close to you, and your fly darts naturally down and across as you retrieve. If Kelly has a choice, this is how he will fish. This is a great bank right here. It's a good holding water. What I've got out there is I've got a, a break. That rock is making a break. It's softening the water on the backside. It's relatively shallow here, but as I look down, there's a trough. Uh, what I may do, I may fish that, and I may step back and fish this trough, or just walk right down the middle and fish it from the other, from in the middle of the river back to me. I don't want to, I don't want to neglect this trough though. It's kind of soft. It's not, I'm going to put a caster through or two through it, but basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to fish that bank. I'm going to hit right on the bank and try to cover that four or five feet from the bank to me effectively. And then I'm going to go through that little quick riffle and go right back in. I'm going to fish every two foot of this all the way down. What I want to show you here is how the, the current and the lack of mending can actually work to your advantage. Right now is a perfect example. What I'm going to do is the, the, the softest current is on the outside, but the fastest current's right here. Knowing that you want the fly's head to come slightly downstream and across, what I do here is it's, it, it's just really easy. It's, I throw out a little bit upstream like that, and as, I, as the current catches my line, it's bowing it, all I have to do is this with my rod. I'm stripping a little bit of line. Notice my rod's straight in front of me. Because the current has, my, has the tension on my fly line, every time I move my hand, my fly moves. It just hops and skips and it flutters anywhere I want it to. And it comes pretty much cross stream how I want it to. But because the current has a hold of my line, Everything I do with even the slightest amount of, you know, rod manipulation, my fly moves. So I'm, I'm letting that, this, the, uh, the tension on the line work for me. I'm not trying, if this is a dry fly scenario, you'd see people going like this and mending upstream and they'd be, you're trying to not have the surface current pull your fly line down and drag your fly. It's ideal for this. It's perfect. It, you know, you couldn't, make it work better if it, if it had to. I, I keep my rod right in front of me, nice and smooth. Just have to twitch it a little bit. Pulls the fly all the way across, perfect. No worries with the drag. I don't like to cast a huge line when I'm fishing a streamer. I'd rather keep it under 40 feet. So I, I move in. I know that I've, I'm covering the water. I'm not really afraid of spooking the fish with waiting. I'm never, oh, I just had a big old flash. I just had, that's what you call a drive-by. One just came up and went like that. Never touched the fly, just came off the bottom a little bit. The big buttery swirl. One thing you'll find that is if, if a fish boils you like that, Half the time he might come back, I don't know, maybe not even half, but generally you don't get the second shot. If you're really intent on catching that fish, which I'm more intent on showing you how to work the water here than I am catching that fish, but what I would do is I would switch fly colors. If he came up and I gave another cast or two, third cast I've totally lost my confidence that, that fish is going to come back. Third cast I would say, okay, I'm going to contrast. and I've got a light colored fly right now. I'd go to a dark fly and I'd put it right back in there. Now if that fish had hit my fly, there's another scenario that has to take place here. If the fish comes up and hits the fly and you just get a thump and you don't really, and it's gone, what you want to do is, what you want to do if one hits it, is you want to go right back into the same area but you don't want to have the same retrieve. What's happened to you 
is the fish has come up and slammed your fly and he's tried to stun your fly. And what happens is the fish will come up, hit it, he'll run downstream. In this scenario right here, I'd say he'd run six to eight feet downstream and he'll be looking for what he's stunned. So let me show you what I do in that scenario. If, I, if the fish hit me, say right there, and what normally you would do is you would go like this. If you get the thump and he's off, you'd go right back where he hits you. And you've pretty much missed your opportunity if you do that. If you're in a boat, it happens too quickly because you're floating. If you're waiting, you've got a lot better chance at this fish. So what I would do is I would take, if he had hit the fly, I would take the fly and throw it slightly past the point of impact, past where he hit me, and I would let that fly, so if I thought he hit me right there, I'd throw two foot past that and I would let it really softly swing downstream. It's almost a, a minor dredge technique. I'm gonna take the fly, he hits there, I'm gonna throw two foot past it and I'm gonna give it some slack and I'm gonna let the fly basically just go totally motionless downstream. What the fish is looking for, he's come up and drilled that thing and he thinks he stunned it. He spins downstream and he waits for whatever it was that he hit and he comes up and he gets to eat it head first. So what I'm doing here is I'm throwing up and I'm working that shoreline. I want to hit that fly within inches of the shore. If you got a nice flat faced rock, you can even hit the rock. I'm hitting as close to the shore. I'm letting the current work the fly for me. If you're in a boat, you don't get the option to let this line work, the surface tension work for you like you do when you're waiting. Because the boat's going with the, the angler, so it doesn't catch the line as well. It actually works better for you as you're waiting. So I'm just looking for soft spots. I'm throwing in. I'm aggressively working the fly. I'm coming across the current every two foot. Coming in, work, work, work. Stepping it off. Stepping it. Looking for players here. I'm not looking for every fish that's out there. I'm looking for one big fish. If you have a compound current like this one, what in a compound current when you've got a soft side and a really fast side, sometimes you can't get away with simply throwing cross stream like I was doing up above there. Sometimes you've got to throw a little mend in it and then start it working. Or you can throw a little curb cast, whichever you prefer, a little reach cast. But all you're doing is you get giving it a little bit more time. If it's a really fast current, like this one's starting to pick up speed right here, and you need a little bit more time, give yourself that break so you still want the fly to come crossed and down, but it'll just give you a little bit of time to let the, the fly come across before the main current or the fastest current catches it. So I could do a little reach cast like this and still work the fly. You can see it's still coming across stream at me and it's still not swinging down. Or if you want, you can throw it in and give it a little bit of a mend like that and then start it to work across. If it's, but again, that's only if you've got a really fast compound current where the middle current's really pulling your fly away from there too fast. One of the toughest forms of holding water to pick out are those places in mid-river. It's hard to judge the depth of water and what structure might lie beneath. You need to look for telltale signs on the surface. A bubble line might indicate where two currents run together, creating a softer seam with some depth. Turbulence on the surface can indicate a boulder beneath, and a change in water color can tell us that there's a change in depth. Fish all these spots, and you will start to get a feel for which will hold fish and which won't. Foam lines tell you something. Right here in the middle, I've got a, a foam line going right down the middle of the river. And what the foam line tells you is that that's where two current seams are meeting. It's bringing the currents together, and right down the center is a slot, and that's a deep, it's kind of gouged it out. It's not really moving too fast. And I could hold a big fish in there real easily. 
So you want to make sure, just like every other situation, that you cover it before you wade through it. I'm wading down to get to that inside bend. And I want to make sure that I give it a couple casts through before I trounce through it. But what's got my attention right now is that shadow. I love shadows. And there's a shadow on that soft bank right there. And I'm going to try to put flies into that, make sure that I cover that well. Shadows are great holding areas for trout. It's a you know, real distinct break in the, for them. They can lay there. They're not, there's hardly any current right on the shore there. I'm going to cover that. Generally, when you see them in the shadow there, they're right on the edge of it. They're right where the sun and the shadow meet. Never afraid to weave one in behind me where I'm going to walk, even in the middle here. I mean, just, it's all a game of odds. You've got to stack them in your favor. I could wade back out and run that right down through here. And I may do that. You know, you've got to look at every situation. I'm going to wade through. If I continue through, this isn't very deep. It's dark. And sometimes that's all it takes for a big fish. The, the water's kind of broken here. It's, it's kind of softer right where I'm wading. That could be a good holding area. But I think I'm just going to continue down and fish this inside bend here. I think I'll step it out just a little bit. And I'll continue just to, to work this bank. I can cover this both sides here. I can cover the deeper slot and the bank without going, ooh, gotcha. Nice little brownie. That fish came within six inches of the bank when the fly hit. And then it followed the fly about two and a half, three feet out before it clobbered it. Nice brown trout. Sculpin eater. This isn't a this isn't a trophy brown, but it sure isn't bad. I'd take it. It's a nice two three pounder. Oh that fish had a that fish had a big heron spear or else an osprey had hit it right in the middle of its side. Sorry I lost it. Nice fish, about 18, 19 inches long. This is not a numbers game. It's all about trophy fish. You might not always bring them to hand, but you will know when you're done if the water holds some really big trout. The flies that Kelly uses to streamer fish are mostly of his own creation. He has developed a series of unweighted patterns that have the look and action he has found you need to trigger big trout. They come in three general classes, sculpin and minnows, leeches and crayfish, and attractors. All are big enough to get a trophy trout's attention. What we've got here is a sampling of my flies that I've developed uh, in conjunction with a lot of other anglers, but these are most of these are my patterns. Uh, what I'd like to go through is basically how I select my flies, you know, which ones I'm looking for at what times of the day. Throw these glasses on, pretty bright out here. Um, basically, I just want to walk through from the beginning because I put, as you can see, I've got, this is a cougar box. A zoo cougar's probably my best known um, sculpin imitation. And I, I put a lot of emphasis on the sculpin. A lot of my patterns, even if they aren't, don't look anything color-wise or anything like a sculpin, a lot of my patterns have got sculpin silhouettes, if you look at them. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second when we get into this next box. But what I've got here is just a sampling of, of cougars. Uh, this is the original zoo cougar. And what it is, is just a, a broad head, big, you know, wide collar for pectoral fins, a bright underbelly, a, yellow tail, you know, uh, marabou tail. What this is, this fly is without a doubt been the most popular fly I've ever sold. Uh, is 
produced so many big fish. It's, I get letters on this fly all the time. I just, it's a great little pattern. It swims uh, real erratic, catches a lot, it flutters a lot. It's just a really, really uh, successful sculpin pattern. When this is wet, it goes down to a point, and that's kind of critical when you, when you think about flies. You need to understand what they look like in the vise, what they look like in the water, are two different things. And if you make sure that when you're looking at flies, look at them in the water, when you're designing them especially, make sure that this doesn't all go into a big, you know, if you're looking for pectoral fins, make sure this stuff stays where it belongs and, and creates the image that you want the fish to see. And this fly has, been, has done that very well. This flank feather goes to a point, the pectoral fins, which is this collar, stick out to the side, nice big broad head. This fly is without a doubt, this is probably uh, if I could have one, it'd be a real tight one. It'd be this or the next one I'm going to go to, the woolly sculpin. But this fly I do in several colors, uh, white, olive. I've got the white here, the olive. Uh, the yellow is the most popular by far. Uh, I got the mocha or the brown one up there. And I also do it in black. And so basically cover the whole gamut. But as you can see next, is a, this is an olive box. And what I've got here is a... This is the woolly sculpin, and I, I don't know if it's the most asked question I get or not, but it'd be real close, but what's your favorite fly? And for an awful long time, the zoo cougar was, but if I, for versatility, I think that the woolly sculpin would have to be right in there with, you know, if I could only have one. Because this fly, uh, I do it in multiple colors, but it's got a lot of the same elements that the zoo cougar does, the broad head, the big pecs, you know, off to the side here, up pectoral fins off to the side. Good silhouette, when it's wet, it goes to a point that looks a lot like a sculpin. In my book, Modern Streamers for Trophy Trout, that Bob Lindzen and I wrote, there's pictures of this fly in there uh, next to a, li to a, a dead sculpin. And it's, uh, you can see when this is wet how much it looks like a real sculpin, but it's just got the profile. But the difference between this and, the, and say, the zoo cougars, the zoo cougars, it'd be hard to think it was anything but a sculpin. With this one, if it was done in white or black or, you know, like this, maybe it's a sculpin, maybe it's a leech, maybe it's a lot of things. But it is so versatile and it fishes so well in so many situations that uh, uh, this, I put a lot of emphasis on this fly. These are, both of these are tied on uh, 3X long shank hooks just regular streamer hooks. I tie this in, like I said, multiple colors. The next class, after I go out of the sculpin and the woolly sculpins, I'm gonna go into the leech patterns or the crayfish patterns. And here I've got Ray Schmidt's uh, Twin Tail Madonna. And this fly here still has mono on it for me fishing it this morning, but uh, this is a twin tail uh, fly rabbit strip. And this fly has been I don't know, you'd classify it, because this is an olive one, but you could classify it as a leech, or you could classify it as a crayfish, because when it swims, when it's wet, these two uh, bunny strips, they kind of come together and flail around back there like a swimming crayfish. But this is a really, really versatile fly as well. We do this one in yellow, white, buff, or tan, olive, and black. And this would be kind of in between. It was kind of half crayfish, half sculpin, half a tractor. This is an incredibly effective fly. If you notice, it's got its flashaboo on the top and it's got just a couple strips of flashaboo in it. I think that's important. You don't want to over flash a fly. Uh, I think you can really put the fish off with too much flash. If you look at that predatory prey relationship, there's always a give and a take. In a minnow, when you pick it up and look at it, you always naturally turn it into the sunlight to make it reflect. But in the water, it doesn't do that. It very seldom is reflective. It's just got an occasional glitter, and that's a trigger for the fish. But for the most part, they're kind of dull underwater. So you want to have a subtle amount of uh, flashaboo or crystal flash, whatever it is you're going to use in there. And, and I like it on top. So we've got the, the sculpin patterns, the leech and crayfish patterns, and finally, there's the attractor patterns. And uh, probably, my favorite attractor pattern is a uh, kind of a takeoff on Joe Brooks's blonde series, which was done in the 40s and 50s. And this is the stacked blonde. This is done on the 
uh, keel hook so it keeps a little bit broader profile. It's really a, this is just a dynamite little fly. Uh, the, the attractor patterns probably have taken more emphasis than, than most of the other types of streamer flies because they're fun to fly, fish and fun to tie. Uh, these here, this is a little rainbow attractor, but you can see here I've got a cone head. This is kind of a takeoff of uh, the Jiggies, Bob Popovic's uh, Jiggy series. And there's a whole bunch of different ones. These are just really fun to tie. That's part of the, their appeal. You know, flashy little attractors. That, attractor class is, you know, basically coming around to the minnow class. And it's just, they're just takeoffs. And I take a lot of my flies and adapt, you know, certain aspects of uh, uh, saltwater patterns. There's a lot of great saltwater patterns out there and a lot of really neat ways to tie saltwater stuff and I try to adapt certain parts of that to a trout fly and that's what the jiggy was here. The cone head is just a stack blonde with a cone head but by and large the, the, the stack blondes I would say for really big fish have accounted for as many the, the yellow stack blonde has accounted for at least half of the fish I've caught over 25 inches. Uh, just generally great attractor appeal. It's real flashy, uh, really easy to cast, makes it really simple for the day. And But as this has progressed, and I, I told you that all of these are a work in progress, and in the last, uh, oh, say five, six years, when we started realizing that the short shanked hooks were a little more effective for holding fish, uh, we started switching things up and trying to do different styles of flies uh, with, with a shorter shank hook, but still trying to get the really big profile. Uh, that, that, for example, this is a, a twin uh, hooked, this would be like the TNA Cougar. Uh, there's a bunch of, we still need names for a lot of these flies. We kind of go as, we kind of go as we can and name them up, but this is a articulated Cougar. Looking at it from the top, it's a lot like all the rest of the Cougars. But if you go underneath, you can see it's jointed. And this was actually the first adaptation uh, that we did that, that worked successfully. The first one I tried was on the, the woolly sculpin. And we tried doing it with bead chain underneath. And we tried all kinds of stuff to get a short shanked hook to work. And then we went to this style. And it really, really was successful. But that was on the, on the sculpin styles. The, the actual original fly is the TNA, which is right here. And this fly has been widely uh, successful for almost every type of fish I know. It's just, it's an articulated fly that the, the key to this is that it articulates, or in other words, it's hinged, and it was designed to look like a jointed Rapala. And we use a hinging mechanism that's mono that, that this fly swims, the back fly swims back and forth, so it gets an S swim. You need to have very little motion on your rod to get an incredible wobble to this fly. So this is really the first one that we used, and it took quite a while to get it dialed in completely. But from this TNA, there was all sorts of offshoots. The, the cougar was part of it, and then we went into some of these other just general attractors. This is a black TNA, and this fly started becoming a, probably the most popular fly uh, that we fish now. Uh, this is a TNA bunker or a TNA rainbow. This fly on the Madison has just become a staple. But I've, in the last two or three weeks uh, of guys coming into the fly shop and talking to me, since this fly came out in Fly Fisherman, I don't know, six months ago or so, this fly has been all over the country. People have been using it. And all it is is the jointed uh, TNA. But it's got the rainbow effect in it. We made it with a you know, little stripe down the side because almost all trout are going to be, they're really predacious on their own young and because there's a lot of them in the river system. And this has become an incredibly successful fly, not only for trout, but guys are telling me they're fishing it for stripers, uh, all kinds of different fish. But this seems to be where the flies are going right now. We're having, because we want the short shank, but we want the long hook, and we want a lot of action out of that fly. So we can get a lot of, a lot of action, a lot of bulk, a lot of movement with not a lot of weight, because that's one of the biggest limiting factors we've got 
is, you know, if I could throw a fly that long for a truly trophy fish, I would, but it just wears you out. And there seems to be a point where we, because we have fished some really huge 10, 12, 13 inch flies, and you don't seem to get that many more big fish coming to them than you do on a fish. I mean, this rainbow right here, this TNA rainbow, TNA bunker, it's about six inches long when it's all said and done and wet. That's a heck of a big profile. And it's, like I said, it swims like crazy. It's just a really easy to cast, really easy to fish. But a lot of the flies right now that I'm developing and working with and trying to steal from other guys as often as I can, those flies are, are developing all off of these. If you consider that most of this started with a muddler minnow, uh, 25 years ago, if you looked in a guy's fly box, you'd probably see a muddler minnow and maybe what was called a spruce fly, something like that. And there's been adaptations of all these flies throughout the last 20 years or so, but it's just in the last four or five years that the streamer has started to take a front, you know, front row seat here. And so you're starting to see all sorts of transitions. A lot of bunny work. This is another great attractor fly right here. This is Scott Sanchez's double bunny. Uh, boy, this is just a super effective fly. It's kind of heavy in the water. It's, a, it's really bulky. It keeps a great big profile. It's got a lot of really neat aspects to it, but you know, this is one of Scott's first, and Scott's a really great fly designer. This is one of his first flies uh, that was brought real national attention to him as a designer. And this fly is, has been adapted in several ways. You know, one thing I didn't really mention too much about was uh, the cone heads or some of the weighted flies. I personally don't weight my flies other than cone heads. Uh, I don't underwrap my flies. I don't try to make them real heavy, but uh, this, the cone head woolly sculpin, the cone head jiggies like this, this fly's a stack blonde, adaptation of a stack blonde. It's got a cone head underneath there, and then I epoxied over top of it. But the cone heads have been really successful in a lot of areas. Where, where the cone heads work really well especially when you've got broken water like we have here on the Madison where there's a lot of turbulence to the water and the fly, a, a lighter fly, sometimes will slap down on the surface and it'll have trouble getting under that hydraulic lift. And these little cone heads, there's just enough weight that they pop through the water. They don't sink like this. They don't sink down. They sink head first. And then every time you touch your line, the fly does this. That's quite radical compared to what it really does. The fly just goes down because it's hooked to your leader. It doesn't really dive like this. So you've got to be careful when you, that's an idea that the fly is diving like this, but you'll see underwater that the fly is hooked to your leader, which is attached to your line, which is attached to you, and it's usually above the fly. So the fly doesn't really dive too much, uh, regardless if you use a loop knot or not. It still only goes so far down, but every time you touch it, it does lift it a little bit so it does give it a little bit of this action and you'll see that that and there's times when a jig head or a cone head will really make the difference in a day what i also found with the jig heads or the cone heads was that for beginning anglers it sometimes makes a big difference especially if you're fishing from a boat if you're taking somebody down the river and they're having trouble keeping up with the boat floating in the current and they're not moving their fly enough the jigging action that that cone head gives it is sometimes just enough to elicit a strike. So it really becomes uh, really beneficial to the fly if you're, really, if you're just starting and you're really having trouble getting the fly to move as fast as you'd like it to. But for, for the most part, what you've got is you've got the sculpin, your leech and your crayfish, your general uh, attractor imitations or your minnow imitations, and then you just adapt off of that. The book has not been closed on developing flies. It drives me crazy when I hear people say there's nothing new. It's that there's nothing further from the truth than that. Every day some guy walks into my fly shop and shows me a fly. I've never seen anything like it. It's, I mean, there's lots of room for things to change and to develop into even better patterns. But the key is, is to keep, keep a little bit of what you're looking for, like a sculpin, try to adapt that fly to what you're going to do to it, you know, with it, in your type of water. Because every time you change something on that fly, you may make it better, you may not. But you know you don't know that until you go out and try it. The key is to see the fly in the vise, see it in the water, make it do what it's supposed to do. Make sure it's 
achieving what you want it to and then just keep you know changing it as it goes if it doesn't need it for example the stack blonde I haven't been able to find a change on that fly in 10 years it's made it better if it's not broke don't fix it the kiwi muddler is another great example of that I can't fix it I've tried I've tried every time I've tried to change it it doesn't work any better if it's not broke don't fix it the zoo cougar same thing but you change a color you change something you just do a little adaptation to that fly and you might have the next you know zoo cougar or woolly bugger who knows but the key is to just keep trying different patterns and different things as important as the flies is the method in which he fishes them he has his own way of determining which pattern and color is working on a particular day the first question i get asked at seminars and uh, emails and whatnot is my favorite fly and the second question is definitely what's my favorite color on color I've got a very basic system that I've worked out over the years you know when I when my systems came about my my job as a guide was to maximize my clients time on the water and generally that meant getting them hooked up as quick as you could so what I did was I came up with a system I found a way I actually started with it in my boat and I just I had a piece of foam and I just I'd try a fly and I'd stick it in the foam so I'd remember exactly how I did this and over the course of a few years I noticed that there just seemed to be a sequence that I I don't know why I went through it but I did and this is how I did it I started out and I always had to have some point of reference something tells me where I start it's a bluebird sunny day and so I, there's an old adage from bass fishing that they said, you know, bright day, bright lure, dark day, dark lure. Seemed like a place to start, so I tried that. On a really bright day, I start with a white fly. So here I'll start, and, I, and I'll tell you now that I don't think that the type of fly is nearly as important as the color of the fly. When I'm, when I'm fishing streamers, I think color is the absolute most important thing there is. Uh, so I start with this color, doesn't matter if it's going to be a, a, a tractor pattern, or a sculpin pattern, it's just the color. I start with white. I never give a fly more than 10 minutes. If it's not producing, if I know I've covered, you know, I'm in a, a side channel to Madison here. As I walked up here to set up and talk, we saw a half dozen fish right here. I know there's fish there. So if I gave this fly 10 minutes, I know I've crossed fish, they're obviously not on it. 10 minutes, I change. And so I go for total contrast. I go from white to black. Doesn't matter the style, I could go from this to this, white to black. If that doesn't work, so I've got my basics, my white, black, then I go to a contrast from this, and I would go into a tan. Tan is a neutral. And I consider the colors, um, I go for neutral from the basic, you know, black and white to neutral tan is the next would be the lightest end of the neutral colors and I go to this tan or buff colored fly this could be this it could be a zoo cougar which is kind of a neutral tan uh, it doesn't matter the style of fly just the color has changed from the tan I'm gonna go to a dark fly in the neutral which is olive all right so I'm kind of all I'm doing is I'm contrasting subtleties here I went from total white black then from tan to olive and from there if it's 10 minutes you know now I've got 40 minutes into this day if that doesn't work I immediately go to either yellow or chartreuse there's not much chartreuse in this box I didn't bring there's some right here yellow or chartreuse and it's always that way it's always the same sequence I generally go from white, black, uh, tan, olive, yellow, and then I go to chartreuse. If that doesn't work, if none of that worked, and I'm still on the river, then I go through the entire sequence again, and I do it by style of fly. So I would go for the white cougar, a black cougar. Uh, you know, doesn't really matter what style of fly, I just kind of stick to a different one. And what you'll find is, or at least I do, is I tend to go through the same pattern selection. Like I start with a cougar or a woolly sculpin, and I may change three or four fly colors in that style of fly. And then I end up with the, with the stacked blonde almost always. 
and if they come on this or if there's any inkling that this is it, I may go through that whole uh, scenario all over again just in this style of fly. But the key is, is to understand you've got to have a system. What you'll find if you're like me, and I've, I've watched this with a lot of guides, what you'll find that you'll happen is you'll continuously, if you don't have a system that you go through, you'll always go back to what worked the last time you fished. And you'll just say to yourself, man, when I was on the Madison last time, I caught them on white. And if they're not on white, it doesn't matter, but if you, you, it won't work. So you've got to establish that color. And for me, the only way to do that quickly is to have a sequence of events. Light, dark, tan, olive, chartreuse, or yellow. And that just seems to eliminate and honestly, if I'm fishing by myself, I don't go five minutes with a fly. So in a half hour, I can pretty much establish the color the flies were on. So basically, that's how I go through my selection. Categorize my fly boxes, by the way, by color, so it makes that system even more simple. So I start with the neutral, uh, or excuse me, the white and the black, and so the, in the basic colors, then I go to the neutrals, you know, tan, olive, or any variation thereof. And that doesn't, just because that's the way I do it, doesn't mean that has to be your sequence. Uh, if you like yellow, for example, you know, brown trout love yellow. And a lot of guides will start with yellow, period. That's just how they're gonna do it. And they'll just go through and they've got their own sequence. Mine is just, that's just the way I've always done it. It makes it very fast for me. You know, in a half hour, I can pretty much establish what color the fish is on. And then I go from there. And I always tell people when they, when they want to learn to streamer fish for predatory fish, you have to understand you're not going to go out and kill a bull moose or a bull elk every time you go elk hunting. Same thing happens here. If you're trophy hunting, you're trophy hunting. You can't look for fish 16 to 20 inches long all day and expect to catch a fish that's 30 inches long. They're predators, they're trophies. And just like any hunting situation in the world, if you take, a, a, for example, a bull elk, if a four by four walks by and you take that elk, you can't shoot a seven by seven right then. You've had your elk. You weren't trophy hunting, you were elk hunting. If you come out here and you're looking for 16 to 22 inch fish and that's what you're gonna catch all day, you aren't gonna throw a fly aggressively enough or big enough to catch a predatory brown trout. You have, to, you have to decide. People come to me and say, I want to learn to streamer fish. I say, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to leave your trout rod at home. And what I mean by that is you can't take a little dry fly rod or you can't take your nymph rod with you and throw those small flies when you get frustrated because you fished for two hours and you haven't caught a big 25 inch trout. It's a, it's a game of numbers. You have to put your time in and you have to go exclusively looking for these really big fish if that's what you want to catch. Otherwise, you're kind of just hoping. And we're not doing that here. We're, we're aggressively fishing for a single fish. If you get that fish early, great. And maybe you get two or three. You can have some really big days. And, and the more you do this, the more of those big days you'll have. But if you're going to be serious about it and you're going to be successful and get that predatory fish, you're gonna have to fish all day, maybe, and you know, for one fish, because that's trophy honey. If you do that, and you do it maybe, you know, five days in a row, somewhere in that group, you're gonna hang a really big predatory fish.